For most of us, the number one source of entertainment in our living rooms would be a television set and a lot of things come into play when choosing one. Budget, specs, size, brand, just to name but a few. It's been almost 8 months since I got this TV and even though I'm a little late to the party, I felt I should do it anyway now that we're in the middle of the TV season and reviews are being flung left, right and center. Hello and welcome to the value space. In this video, I'll be reviewing my 85 inch Samsung Q68 TV. Buckle up and let's go for the ride. While in the hand for a TV set, I wanted a jaw dropper that sat on the sweet spot between affordability and good quality features and this behemoth fit the bill perfectly. To make it better, it was on sale at the time of purchase and that helped me shell a couple hundred dollars on the price tag. My short story aside, let's get straight into it. For starters, the Q60A is an entry-level model for Samsung's QLED lineup and the successor to the Q60T from 2020. Kicking off with the design. Design-wise, despite being an entry-level TV, it looks pretty nice for a model in its price range. It's got a minimalist design with thin black bezels wrapping around the screen and like many of Samsung's TV models that came out in 2021, it carries on with a thin profile. Of course, a couple inches thinner than its predecessor, the Q60T. Taking a closer look at this chassis, it's well built and even though it's entirely made out of plastic, it feels premium and it's super sturdy. Taking it through my quality standard check, it suddenly ticks all the boxes. To confirm this, I had to bring in my quality assurance expert and even though the process was quite eventful, I have no doubts in the final outcome he gave me. Moving to the rear panel, since I already have it wall mounted, I'll use this photo from Reddings to take you through. Like its predecessor, you've got the digital optical audio out and HDMI 3 slightly off the main input compartment pointing to the wall. Something to be aware of, as they do point straight to the wall, you'll have to avoid using a low profile wall mount as it wouldn't give enough clearance to plug in any inputs. Rolling into the main compartment, at the very bottom you've got the cable TV connector. Moving up. You've got the HDMI 1, HDMI 2 ERC, commonly known as the Enhanced Audio Return Channel, which allows you to send audio from your AVR or soundbar. Next up are the LAN cable port, USB 1 and 2. Then on the very far side, you have the power cable port, and I like the right angle design that ensures the cable doesn't crease because of bending. Something to note though, even though they're not HDMI 2.1, the number 2 HDMI has an enhanced audio return channel and it's compatible with auto low latency mode so it can automatically set the TV to gaming mode when a gaming system is detected. All this encompassed in a 45.3x74.8x14.5 inch chassis in terms of height, width and depth. Now, to put it into perspective, I'm not a small blog. I'm about 6 foot and 4 inches tall with a wingspan of 6 foot and 9 inches and I'm right at the cusp of clearing the whole width of the TV. Trust me, from that side of the screen it doesn't look massive but when you see it in person that's when you'll truly believe how big it is. To cut this segment off I added Govi RGB light strips which I set to different modes to set different modes especially in evenings. Moving on. When it comes to the screen, the Q60A has an edgely dual LED VA panel that runs at 60Hz. Okay, I'll pause for a moment. I know you're already scratching your heads, wondering what a VA panel is. Well, to put it simply, it stands for vertical alignment and is a type of LED panel technology that is characterized as having the best contrast and image depth among the other main types of display panels. Stepping back from that clarity moment, it also has 10 bits and if you'd want to use gaming consoles like the PS5 or Xbox Series X, it would do just fine, but you wouldn't be getting the most, let's say, if you use them on a Neo QLED with a refresh rate of 120Hz. More on that in just a bit. Now, 
Even though it's an entry level QLED, you're getting those rich deep colors but without the added expense of full array backlit panel and as mentioned earlier, it uses LED technology which is edge lit and because of that, the blacks don't get quite as dark as they would on a full array panel like the Q80A has but for its price point, it's absolutely punchy. Hey 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 hey, hold on a second. And that's not to say everything is fixed in stone. You can always make adjustments to the picture quality yourself or you can choose from the several preset options. In addition to that, the Q60A can play back HDR10 Plus and HLG content, which look decent even with a slight limitation on black levels. Something I've come to learn on a lot of the newer TVs, setting them to auto does a good job determining the best settings based on the content you're watching. But then again, you'll still have the ability to turn them off completely or to customize them to your liking. Now, I know we'd want the pleasure of being able to sit anywhere in our living rooms and still be able to enjoy content in full detail. Unfortunately, with a Q60A, as you start to step off to the side, you slowly start to lose the details and by the time you are completely edged on one side, the image quality is heavily washed out. Unlike entry-level QLEDs, near QLEDs or OLEDs have an almost infinite viewing angle with little to almost no compromise in image quality as you start to move off to the side. For that reason, the best sitting position for an entry-level QLED like this one would be dead center. Up next, you have the menu and user interface. Since there's a multitude of things, I'll just start on the main ones. Samsung hasn't made any radical changes and most of the features we've seen have been in previous-gen Samsung TVs. Pressing the home button, a list of apps pop up at the bottom of the screen and you can arrange them in any order you like. Some of the features we've been accustomed to are Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, Bixby among many others. There's also Samsung Channel Plus which provides you with tons of free-to-air channels and if you're looking for more, there's plenty of other apps that can be downloaded from the Samsung app catalog. Moving across, you've got the ambient mode which allows you to put the TV in a picture frame which usually happens when the TV detects no activity for a while. You have the option of matching it with different colors of your wall, pick different pieces of art under artwork or my album which will come from your personal cell phone or gallery. We also have this new feature called multi-view although I wouldn't be diving deep into it. How it basically works, it allows you to have live station and another screen on the TV, which is kinda cool. As you can see, it's looking for the antenna, which I don't have connected at the moment, and on the other side, you can mirror your phone or any other screen. Right across, you've got your home workout preset, which enables you to pull up designated YouTube videos, use your phone camera or a USB camera. What this essentially does is allow you to watch workout videos and a camera that checks your posture to make sure you're doing it correctly. Being a person who's big on health and fitness, this feature comes in clutch. Anchoring the rest of the features are the apps right at the bottom of the screen and something to be mindful of, in order to use these apps, you have to be logged into your Samsung account. As you can see, I'm logged into my Samsung account and without this, you can only look them up but can't use. Diving in, we have the apps we've been accustomed to. YouTube, Netflix, Disney+, Amazon, and for those in Australia, apps like 9 News, 7 News, among many others. As for the user interface, the layout is good and I do like the idea of bringing up trending or recommended shows. The main caveat is it's a bit slow and laggy. Bringing the menu up and navigating through isn't as fluid as I'd wished it to be, and if future updates can fix that issue and make it snappy, that would be amazing. Other than that, the fact that this TV supports everything I need is incredible. The apps in here are amazing and some of my favorites are YouTube, Netflix, Stan, Optus and it's so easy to jump in between these apps with this remote which I'll be telling you more about in just a sec. Over here we have the Samsung One remote which Samsung thinks it's the only remote control you need owing to the fact that the TV has Bluetooth and through updates it can talk back to the remote control and program it. I like its sleek and minimal design and this is something a lot of people are going to be excited about. It's always a pain when the batteries run out and you have to hope there's some extras lying somewhere. Well, Samsung has officially taken that potential irritation off the table. The new remote can be charged through the solar panel at the back or a USB-C. Even better, a single charge can last months on end. To put that into perspective, I last charged this remote end of January and it still doesn't need any juicing up to date. Taking a closer look, the layout is almost identical to the 2020 version but this one has a multi-view with a picture-in-picture -picture feature that allows you to watch multiple things at the same time. 
Moving on to the software updates. Over the last 6 months, there have been a few software updates that Samsung has sent out. Most of these have fixed bugs or the TV itself. It's always important to ensure your TV is on the latest software for the ultimate user experience. Moving on to gaming, in reality, the Q60A probably wouldn't have been in the running for the best gaming TV of 2021, but that doesn't mean it's bad for it. It just doesn't have all the next-gen gaming features like variable refresh rates or 4K at 120Hz. It does have auto low latency mode though, which puts the TV into game mode automatically when it detects a gaming system being used. So, if you have a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox Series X, you'll need to upgrade to the Q80B or higher to get the absolute most out of them. Nonetheless, if you don't have either of those or you're just a casual gamer that doesn't need all the bells and whistles, the Q60A is going to be just fine. Moving on to sound, the Q60A sound is possible and in comparison to its predecessor, it comes in at a distant second. I know a lot of you are asking, how is an older version better? Now, hear me out. A lot of it has been beaconing towards its thin profile, which aesthetically looks amazing, but leaves very little room for speakers, although there's nothing definitive about that reason. One thing that stands out is a lack of bass. It has a low frequency extension of about 127 hz which is poor even by TV standards. In addition to that, the distortion is pretty bad as well, and a soundbar or speaker system would help cover these blemishes. To sum it all up, after using it for a while, I'd say the pros outweigh the cons. If you're on the market for a TV and you're on a little bit of a budget, the Q60A has an abundance of free content, a solar powered remote, and great quality without the higher cost of a premium TV like an OLED or a Neo QLED. This TV would be the best choice. Before I sign out, here are some of my other videos and make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell to get notified whenever I post a new video. People of the internet, I'm signing out. See you on the next one.